And we're that right. helps it. Oh. All right, welcome back, everyone. Another edition of the History Buffs. Uh, going diving back into the Civil War once again. No reason. I don't think there's anything uh, going on in the world that we could possibly relate to the Civil War at all. Nothing seems to. <laughs> nothing seems to be happening again uh, around around this country or any other country. Really, you know, world peace is, is a great thing. So, uh, we we are joined once again by R. A. Menahan, Ned oh, Snark, wow. and Austin from New London. Uh, and we're picking up right where we left off last week. So if you haven't seen those, go back, check them out. Uh, really a deep dive in the Civil War. So it might not be for everyone, but hopefully it's for you. Is that is that corny enough? You think? Is, is that no, a way to corny people? enough? Uh, so, <laughs> so sixty three, eighteen sixty three is where we're starting, uh, and we'll start right on the first day of it because it kicks off with the Emancipation Proclamation. Basically, uh, Lincoln calling the uh, Confederates bluff, as Ned said it uh, pre-show here, that um, basically it, it set the stage for anyone joining any you know non-union state, non-union you know uh, territory joining back into the union would have to do it without slaves. It sets the precedent that uh, there's no slaves in the union, so to get back in, um, that's you know, that's basically where you have to be as a, as a state and you have to be willing to accept that. So, uh, Austin, you were talking about how it also affects uh, Europe as well. Yeah, I know uh, the South was trying to get uh, England to enter the war because uh, England was very reliant on their cotton for textiles. So, you know, they were trying to convince them to enter the war on their side. But England, before our Civil War, had already... Uh, abolished slavery in, in their country. So by the North abolishing slavery, it kind of, it was, it would be a bad look for them to then fight on the side of slavery. And so it really prevented them from entering the war or, you know, solidify that they would right. not enter the war. Right. And, and also, really, like France, you, you had France who also was, you know, trying to, the, the South was pretty much just trying to get recognized by anyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, you know, in the mid 18th century, they were the only people mainly in Western Europe and the Western world who still had slavery. So it's hard right. to get behind a cause with something that you've already banned and that you've already condemned. So with right. Lincoln, yeah, he wanted to free slaves, but he also wanted to keep Europe out of the war as well. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. And after the after the uh, European upheaval of 1848 and, and uh, all the progressive governments coming in, there was no way. The only country that may have recognized him would have been Russia, who still had serfs. Yeah. Yeah, but no way. Yeah. No way would Austria or France or, or Germany or any of the Italian states never would have, never was going to happen. And, and it really leaves no doubt that a war that, you know, some argue started about just, you know, keeping the union intact, because as we discussed earlier, Lincoln was not an abolitionist when he got elected. That, well, that's not what he was for. He was not for spreading slavery any further than it was. The Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation really makes it clear that this war is now about slavery. Right. Right. Uh, which is obviously an important point because you're going to see in, in 1863, you'll see the first, um, you know, African-American regiment fight for the Union. Uh, you know, volunteers, all volunteers um, fight for the Union down in the South. Um, and you're also going to see a draft begin. The, the South started a draft in 1862, a year earlier, and the Union is going to follow suit early on. I want to say it's March. I'll just double check that. But, uh, yeah, March in early March, 1863, you're going to see, you know, drafting soldiers for the union as well, yep. which leads to, you know, draft riots in New York later on in the year um, and has negative consequences. But I think Lincoln felt like he could do that because of the Emancipation Proclamation. Now we're fighting for something that, you know, some might say, oh, let the South do what they want. It doesn't affect someone who lives in, you know, Maine or Vermont, New Hampshire. But now it's about Men, all men. It's about freeing, you know, people that are, are in chains. And um, I think that gives Lincoln some capital to be able to, you know, do something like a draft that was clearly needed at this time. Because, you know, as we discussed in previous episodes, the war wasn't going great for the union, or at least it wasn't going the way that most outsiders and people looking back today probably thought it should have gone early on. Yeah. And, and, and unlike that uh, 1619 bullshit thing from the New York Times, um, many people who lived up north, did have a more felt a moral obligation for the nation as a whole that they that now that it is about slavery and this isn't across the board of course but uh, right. a lot of the a lot of the more uh, advanced thinkers were, were were felt that there's now a moral and just and and uh, divine cause to to heal the nation bring the nation together without slavery so it did it did spur a lot of uh, 
nationalism on the north like we've got to we have to reunite we have now a good cause to do it because they really didn't want to fight for you know state tariffs you know right and, and, you could, tariffs. and you could see that in the way the union fought the war i mean we talked about it, it was bad leadership but it was also yeah. you know potentially a, a lack of enthusiasm about the cause what you're fighting for we're fighting to keep you know if, again if you're a, a soldier from mm -hmm. you know new jersey you're you're down you know you're, you're literally your brothers are dying fighting a war to keep states in that you probably have never been to and might never go to in your life. So why, how does that really affect your life? Now with the, the cause of, you know, slavery and fleeing, freeing the slaves, you know, you might have a little more motivation. It might be a little more, you know, up your alley in terms of why you're fighting. It might be a little more a motivation moral, for that. A moral justification. Right. Right. Do you guys think that the Emancipation Proclamation was necessary for the Union to win? Like, could they have won without it? Go ahead, Austin. I, I'm not sure. I... One of you guys go. I'm really not sure. I, I, I think I, that I think, I think they definitely would have. I think I probably would have. You think it was inevitable? Like even if even I, if I Europe got the, the war. Resources. I mean, I think it's Ooh. as long. That's different. Right. But I still. That's not I, what you asked. Right. Yes, that's not what you asked. It is what I asked though, because the Emancipation Proclamation <laughs> kept Europe out of the war. I yes, still, but I think I, we also I, I, and I also you, you know, earlier I mean, that. He was also saying earlier that I mean that Europe wasn't trying to join in necessarily anyway because they were you know they would be potentially joining a side that was trying to was fighting to essentially keep their slaves, which is something yeah. a lot of European countries already uh, most if not all had already gotten rid of. And then Ned said in a previous episode that Europe was not so reliant on cotton at that point as anymore as they used to be. They were starting to use other. Uh, products to make their textiles. I can't remember what you said specifically. Irish slave but, labor in, <laughs> in, for linen, yeah. But, and right. Egyptian cotton, too. Mm -hmm. True. And yeah, suppose, were, that's true, but supposedly Turkish as well, but Egyptian cotton supposedly wasn't as high a quality as uh, American Southern cotton at the time. Now I think it's changed, but that was, that was it's absolutely true. There was, uh, your, uh, Egypt tried to close the, the gap, but they switched to, they switched over to, uh, to linen in the UK. And that'd be the only thing that would have pulled the European countries in is the need for cotton. It would have been purely economic reasons that they would have gotten involved. And I don't, Tobacco. I don't, I, they had clearly they had other, other options. So I don't, I think the Emancipation Proclamation was good, obviously in general, just by the long term ramifications of it, especially right after the war ended with, the, with Reconstruction and the passing of the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, all that stuff. But I think it maybe would have prolonged the war, but I don't think it would have changed the, the outcome. I mean, so, I mean, I got, I mean, could England have wanted to just join the war to try to like recapture some of the colonies or were they over at this point? I think they're already, they're already oh, they, they were, they tried yeah. that early with the war of 1812. I know, but like, this is another opportunity if they <laughs> see they can side with the, uh, with the South, they could march North and try to capture all the new England again. Like, I don't isn't that a side plot in one of the Sherlock they, Holmes movies? Probably, I don't know. They were, <laughs> no, they were. They were at the time. At the time, England was too focused on on uh, on India. Okay. On yeah, I mean, and, right. so, well, and, and, trying, own, just, and they had Canada, so they had like a lot of. Yeah, timber. I'm just trying to rationalize a reason. I'm just trying to rationalize a reason why, other than for the uh, cotton, that England would eventually want to join the war. Because I don't think well, cotton would be that much of a influencing factor eventually. Like I, think I don't know, man. Money talks. Money talks. Well, st sticking to sticking to to Ra's question, you know, was the Emancipation Proclamation necessary? No, but it 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 wasn't necessary. But you did need it. it slavery needed to end. So you know, come on. Yeah. But I don't no, know. I, I think it was questioning been, that, Ned. It would have been a war of attrition. <laughs> well, it sounded like it was. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it, no, it was it, it, through a war of attrition. Again, they had there's no manufacturing in the South. They had no arms. They had to import everything. There was an effective blockade. Could England have breached the blockade? Maybe. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was again, pretty, risking were, a war with a country that's already beaten you twice in the last hundred years. Yeah. And, and, and what's the, what's the risk reward in that? And that's that right. been a very expensive endeavor. Um, so yeah, money talks. I don't know if it would have been worthwhile for England and, uh, they just had more men with they had tons of immigrants in New York and Boston and Philadelphia, Chicago. They, and, they, had, they had cannon fodder, literally. They could just kept pushing yeah. these people up, up to the front. And it, it was also... It was also a time where England was in the midst of the Industrial Revolution also, which you can make an argument, you know, plays for, okay, we need more cotton, need more resources from America. But also there's 
that there's an economic interest to not do that because they're trying to you know manufacture their own way through the industrial revolution that was starting you know that had basically already started in that country as well well england tried to sell arms to the south um but they they couldn't get through the blockade uh, enough times to make it a profitable venture so a few ships got through but not enough to really make it like you know okay we can make a run uh and and the south couldn't get ships out either so it was just right. a mess. So no, I don't think the, the Emancipation Proclamation was needed to to win the war. I don't even think it would have prolonged the war. I think it, the war probably would have, maybe with better generals, it could have ended quicker. Sure. Um, but no, I, there was just too many too many northern soldiers available. So the the blockade you keep referring to, that's the Anaconda Plan, which was I believe was proposed at the beginning of the war. Um, essentially, it's a stranglehold on the South, all you know, using the Navy of the North, because obviously the South didn't really have much of a Navy to speak of. Um, it was essentially ships blockading all southern ports, and that really came into you know really came into effect in 1863. It was going on throughout the war, but it came it really started to you know pay dividends for the Union after um, the siege of Vicksburg. So moving ahead a little bit, again the Emancipation Proclamation happens in January. Draft starts in March for the Union. Um, really, not much else goes on. You have the Battle of Chancellorsville in uh, early May, which is a big one. But then right around the same time, you also have the Siege of Vicksburg, which is on the Mississippi River in Mississippi. Uh, and then once that siege is over, once the Union with Grant, uh, finally a good Union general, once he you know wins that battle at Vicksburg, then you have the stranglehold that you're really looking for. Um, the Union owns the Mississippi River as well as, you know, the, the Gulf and also obviously the Atlantic Ocean as well. So there's really, at this point, the South is essentially cut off and fighting with the supplies that they have. Yeah. Yeah. Win Winfield Scott's Anaconda plan. Yep. yep. And yeah, they just strangled them. You know, I, exactly. I think that alone could have, you know, brought the South to their knees. Sure. At least in the negotiating yeah. tables, if they didn't want all out, you know. Now, at this point, they didn't want unconditional surrender. They could have at least, you know, done that. At this point, were these ironclads that they were uh, using for the blockade, or is it still mostly like wooden ships? <laughs> Ari's done it again. <laughs> uh, no, I think they, they, were, they were uh, they were uh, they were sail. They were wooden sail ships, yeah, or, or maybe they were iron hulled ships. But uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and they had. Um, they did have clipper ships, but not you know for commercial for merchant use. But uh, the the navy did not have any of those. So they had mm -hmm. they had the four riggered ships that were the big huge ships, biggest yeah. ones ever built. Did, did the navy ever really like fully utilize uh, ironclad ships, or did it really just like it skipped it straight to like the battleship and yeah? Because like, again, that's all with the industrial did. revolution. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, I I would I think even you're right. Because yeah, there wasn't there wasn't really much need for. Because think there really wasn't. Too many, too many war until you get to American imperialism in the you know the the late late eighteen hundreds. There's really not much else going on after the Civil War. Yeah, no. and to further underscore Ari's point about the, the Emancipation Proclamation, the the South was still fighting fewer men, even on the field itself. They were they were always undermanned. They were never really overwhelming on the field. So, um, and before you get to even while while Grant was working on Vicksburg, it was a prolonged siege. It was not like a two week siege. It was, yeah, it was starts in months. starts in like, mid May and it ends actually it ends after Gettysburg and yep, it um, ends the July same 4th. day. July yeah, 4th. July 4th, yeah. 4th, yeah. Yep. So, but the so so they're still trying to punch it out in Virginia, like hoping for a breakthrough. Either the North can break through and, and make a run at Richmond, or the Confederates can get, have a breakthrough and make a run at Washington. Um, so when in May um, they squared off in Chancellorsville, and again Lee with Longstreet and uh, Jackson were were under undermanned, and they were uh, facing a far superior force. But this time it was under uh, Massachusetts' own Thomas J. Hooker, whose name goes down mm -hmm. to live in history uh, <laughs> because of his um, his uh, appreciation of uh, the ladies of the evening. I think, um, <laughs> and it was it was and besides you know, yeah. yeah it is it really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. he's a good economist. I almost yes. had that as a banner, to be honest with you. So <laughs> that would have been a true one. That would have been, 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 right. been, been, been a good. Fact. That would have been right. Yeah. Um, but but Chancellorsville is is an interesting side note because it comes. It's a major victory for the Confederates. Also after Fredericksburg at the end of at the end of 1862. Um, but it was also the one of the few times I can remember reading in history where the the 
one of the leading generals on the field or the leading general on one side on the field was actually like knocked unconscious um, in modern times. And mm -hmm. he, a cannonball was fired from the Confederates and burst over a post uh, uh, of a column that he, that Hooker was leaning on uh, as he's surveying part of the battle, not the whole thing. And he was so shocked that he, he was so like unnerved by it that he was just let off the field and, and command was put into his sub generals. And then at this point, um, uh, Jackson flanked the, his entire army the entire Northern army and started pushing them back into the center line. So you had Longstreet on one flank who was holding the line and, and they, uh, Jackson was just pushing, pushing, pushing like all day through and they called it off for darkness. Like when Lee was saying, we should keep going. And Jackson says, we can't see who we're fighting anymore. And right. uh, while Jackson was out reconnoitering their position or the, the Yankee position, that's when uh, his own, he was returning from a recon reconnaissance mission. That's when he got shot in the arm. Got shot, yep. Didn't die, die immediately, but died. Yep, died. Uh, friendly gang. fire, right? right? Friendly fire. He was returning yeah. from, yep, yep. Yep, so, so that's... Um, so that was just going to say that, that that's the Battle of Chancellorsville. Again, it viewed as one of Lee's greatest victories. I don't, I don't know if yep. Lee ever lost in Virginia. Um, doesn't seem like it anyway. Viewed as one of his greatest victories. And that was just that's before dramatic. Vicksburg starts. So it really picks yep. up in 63 in May. Chancellorsville's early May. You have the Siege of Vicksburg, which eventually, once that's complete, will solidify the Anaconda plan for the north. And it um, puts Grant on the map. Yes. It puts Grant and yep. Grant on the map. And Sherman, his number two. Yep. Sherman yep. And and Lincoln, yep. Lincoln took a notice and liked what he saw. Yep. Mm -hmm. So right after the Battle of Chancellorsville, you have um, Lee, the you know Robert E. Lee, the the you know Lee general for the South. You have him asking uh, Jefferson Davis, the South, I guess, president, yep. um, that you know asking to hey, we need to take this war officially into the North. We got to get out That's of Virginia. Right. We got to keep you know, behind the neighbors of right. Virginia. We got to go. Uh, I believe they use what well, the planners are use the Appalachian Mountains, right, as as cover basically to Correct. move up, move up to the west Great. of the Appalachian Mountains, and then basically sneak around the 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 Union's flank, essentially, um, which will lead us into Gettysburg. Yep. Is there anything we want to get to before Gettysburg? We touched on siege of Vicksburg is going on at this time. Um, it, it's coming off obviously Chancellorsville, as we just talked about the one of the biggest. Um, you know, Southern victories in the war, especially, you know, the second half of the war. Um, anything else you want to touch on before we get to Gettysburg? I, except, huh? except for the, the, the army of Northern Virginia changed generals and commanding generals again. I don't think there was anything that really happened. Lee was uh, emboldened by the, the overwhelming victory, even though now he lost Jackson, you know, because mm -hmm. now he had replaced Jackson. So he had to reorganize his corps. But um, yeah, he just started marching. So it took him like, you know, a good month to get to get going and get the provisions. And like yeah. you said, KBL, he used the Blue Ridge Mountains to mask his movements until he was already into Maryland. That's yep. only when the Union discovered, oh shit, he's flanking around us. Yep. So he gets all the all the way up into Maryland. And then obviously to Pennsylvania. It's, uh, Gettysburg's in southern Pennsylvania. So um, by far the you know most northern battle of the war. Uh ever that, that'll ever happen to furthest north the south will ever get um so just put it in context in terms of months like ned was just saying early may battle of chancellorville ends and then you know it takes a while to get all the troops together get moving the uh, and then you know gettysburg will begin literally two months after the battle of chancellorsville began uh in uh, in july july 1st 1863 yep. and it was a pure accident that um Lee did not have um, Stewart. Jeb Stewart was his major general for the cavalry. Cavalry, right? Yep. Yep. And Stewart was was very good, but he was also known to to go off for like you know glory runs where he would go, he would go rogue. He would just go. Yeah, rogue. he would go rogue. Right. Yep. Exactly. Then he kind of disappeared when Lee needed him most. When Lee's in enemy territory, and he couldn't, he didn't hear from he didn't hear from uh, Stewart for a number of crucial days. And he lost track of where the enemy's army was, not realizing that they were paralleling him uh, behind him, but paralleling him on the other side of the mountain. And a clash was inevitable, but it wasn't going to be as Lee anticipated on his terms. It was going to end up being on the Union's terms. So it right. didn't go well. And I, and I put, you know, when you read about that battle, you put the full blame, at least for the for the positioning of the, of the armies and where they took the field, is squarely on the lack of... Uh, 
uh, of reconnaissance um, that, yeah. that Lee didn't have because Stuart was out gallivanting. Right. Because at, at the time, when, when armies Joy, were moving right. at this time, they were using they used their cavalry, their horse soldiers yeah. as advanced scouts. They would generally lead, um, you know, lead the you know the the advance. They'd they'd be you know going different positions. What's the best way to move? You know, massive amounts of men and, and equipment. What's the best way to do that? Best way through? Because again, we're not always talking about paved roads here, right? Um, yep. So, uh, battle begins basically. <laughs> essentially the, the south rounds one of the bends or like a a pass in the mountains where it kind of flattens out opens up and um like oh union's right here aren't they? Shit. look yeah, who's there yep. <laughs> yep and so that, that that part on um july and he happened 1st. to come across the advance the advance parties yeah. um while lee was was further behind the advance parties uh underneath uh, jubal early who was uh, one of the two generals that that um Lee used to replace Jackson stumbles upon one of the most hard ass union generals that are out there. Um, I forgot his first John Buford was his name. Um, and Buford was just one of these guys, just a, a great soldier, but you never hear about him. You never read about him, but he's the one who took uh, the Ridge cemetery Ridge and yep. saw that, like that J that like fish hook that looks yeah. like a J of, of, of Gettysburg. And he's the one who grabbed the foremost Hill high ground with, like 2000 troopers, you know, guys on yeah. not really cavalry, but just armored guys on horses held that ground until the rest of the, and then sent word back to, uh, to get your ass up here and give us right. a hand. We found the army and, uh, and he held them there. And, um, the, 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 the South stupidly attacked him, or I should say early stupidly attacked him when he shouldn't have. And again, when Lee heard about that, it's like, he realized, you know, another mistake had been made Yep, because he was going to have to fight a battle, not on his terms, which you never right. want to do. And, you know, so there there was a, a little town of Gettysburg at the time. And the first day, they're actually, they did fight through the town. There was, a, I believe there was a, a civilian was killed. They were shot through a, through a house, I think, that killed a, a young woman, I believe. I, I remember hearing stories about that. Um, so there, well, there was fighting through the town a little bit, but it was really mostly up on the hills around Gettysburg. And, I, you know, I think we were talking earlier, at least, Ari, I know you've been there. Yes. Ned, you as well? I've been there one time, but I get there at night when it's a long story. Okay. I was there, but not, 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 not <laughs> uh, so it's 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 a flat area, kind of like rolling hills, though. Yep. So there's good, yeah. Like, it's you, like you there's can, a lot of like fields, yeah. tons of fields, and then like in around the the town. It's so, like right now it's like a college town. Mm -hmm. You know, they get it for college there, but um, they they do have a like it's a almost it's a pristinely preserved battlefield. Massive. So they do. Massive. It's really huge, cool. but they yeah. they still just there's just massive, massive fields, and you can go up like on the ridge, and you can just like they they held they they'll tell you like okay over here was like fifty thousand people, over here was like twenty thousand yep. people, and it's yeah, but the, yeah, it's a big place. So the the union took short. up defensive positions around this, this place. ridge line. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's big. <laughs> There, were there a lot of people there are. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> General Mahan, can you describe the battlefield? Yeah, yeah do you mind? A, <laughs> big big place. Place. Big place. Yeah. a lot of people. People died. A lot of people. People died. Not die. good. Nope, not good at all. Not good at all. <laughs> so the, the the ridge line again, not very gradual roll, just an elevated flat area essentially is what it is. That's the position the Union occupied. That's the the J hook that um, you guys were just talking about. Basically, the Union made defensive lines up and was like, hey. Come get us! Right. And so the the first day was a lot of um, definitely obviously heavy fighting, the bloodiest battle of the Civil War, but heavy fighting on the first day. But a lot of kind of feeling each other out. What were yeah. the vulnerable spots? Where the weak spots? Um, so then we get to day two, where you have the uh, infamous uh, big round top and little round top. Right. And you know, I'll, I'll start with that. I'm sure you guys want to jump in, but um, this was at the I believe the southernmost tip of the yeah. of the line, right? And it was the day before you had the attack on the, uh, the northernmost, which is where they were coming in from. Basically, right. that's why it happened at the, the northernmost edge of that, you know, J hook, fish hook uh, line that the Union had. But um, the, the heaviest fighting was in and around Devil's Den, yep. right below Little Round Top, Big Round Top. The, the most, I guess, severe elevation, the most hill like, you know, terrain you'd, you'd say. And we're talking maybe elevation of what, a couple hundred feet, maybe. Right. Maybe, um, I mean, but the I, I forget who it was someone one of the union, not generals, but one of the union higher ups had the idea of can we try to get cannons on this on these hills? And at first it was just big round top that was the name of the right. name of the hill. And then they're like maybe we should extend it down to little round top too. Maybe they'll come from this area, and, and they did. And they came from 
the you know the southern flank of the Union trying to attack up this hill that um, I believe Southern scouts said the night before wasn't occupied. It was a very right. last minute change to put put troops on basically defending the whole flank of the Union. If they weren't there, they would have ran through right through them essentially from the side. Um, and you know heavily heavily wooded area, but overlooked an, an opening, uh, kind of an open clearing. So what? Yeah. So what? What happened was the um, the hook was a little bit closed on the on the most extreme southern flank, but when they noticed that the the uh, Confederates had had um, put cannon on Big Round Top, um, because the fighting was also more towards the middle, right? So mm -hmm. uh, uh, like the Twentieth Maine, which is what probably we're going to get to, is most yep. famous most famous company. Um, they were under command of somebody from New York, so the, he said, "Hey, listen, extend your line, all you guys, take your your." your your core and extend the lines out as far as you can go because we don't want to be flanked and then um you know they famously tell um joshua lawrence chamberlain you know you know you you realize you're the end of the union line right you are yeah. the end of the line and he's like yeah yeah i, I think i understand and he's like no no, yeah, no you have to understand if you go it rolls right up you know and he's like okay i get it and then uh long street was down um he sent i think the second alabama regiment and a Texas regiment. So two battle tested uh, troops. I mean, two troop, pretty good, pretty good fighting troops. They, they've been, they've been around um, and they had the, the, on uh, the thankless job of fighting uphill. Which yeah. Sucks. And, and not only uphill, I mean, I, I know, you, it's area, I know you, you've seen it. Devil's Den, it, it was referred to as, was this like kind of rocky formation yeah, at the base of the right. hill. And it's, yeah, it's I mean, not. it's literally, imagine, <laughs> imagine, no, it's terrible. It's not, wide not open. General, General Menahan just, just it's chimed not, in again. Not great. How's the terrain there? Not great terrain. It's not great terrain. Not great terrain. Not great terrain. terrain. Not great terrain. <laughs> yeah, not, not good terrain. But yeah, it's just it, rocky, you know, kind of earthy ground to fight them but again wide open so these guys are charging through it fighting through it and you, you got shells bursting all around just you know exploding yeah, rocks canisters. all over them. yeah the, the can yeah canister shots right. which are just things this big full of like metal pellets essentially full explode. of musket balls really mm. yeah. Yeah, yeah just just shrapnel a dozen grenades floating all around them yeah. yeah like a massive grenade basically coming at you at terminal oh. velocity basically yeah <laughs> yep so they're trying to fight uphill but again you still have that um Part of the uh, the southern line trying to get around them so not only are they fighting uphill they're also fighting on the side of little round top which is yep. literally charging uphill at this point through a forest basically with you know you have union troops up at the top essentially using trees as cover just you know kneeling laying down using trees as cover natural you know natural cover that they had um and just confederates charging up through the trees so you had this wide open battle going on you know in the front of the line but on the side you also had on, on little round top again right next to you, you could you could throw a baseball from one hill to the other like right next to each other and you know some of the most heavy heavy action of the war as general yeah. menahan would say not good not great <laughs> not good not great not great. It's not not great. good lots of land rough terrain and, and no not good yeah it's not good <laughs> so I, after two days the the casualties on both sides were incredible but especially on the south and as we just talked about the south really didn't have many to give um so what they decided they they you know there was fighting going on in the middle consistently they did that just try to hold basically hold the troops in the middle as kind of a diversionary tactic to hopefully then get around if they could um they tried the the northern flank the first day didn't work southern flank the second day didn't work and they're like well why don't we just concentrate all our troops to the middle that's where it seems to be the the easiest to attack we can't get the other two can't get the the sides let's go right at them and that leads us into pickett's charge uh what they were on day three what they weren't anticipating was after the heavy fighting with again mostly the best troops you put your best troops on the flanks after all the heavy fighting i forget i forget which general it was but the one of the union generals rotated all those battle weary troops but again the the most battle hardened tested troops to the middle well yeah that's what uh so chamberlain that's uh, his, the 20th main got rewarded after yep. like executing yeah. that perfect uh hinge movement to drive down the alabamans um and they won the battle un un incredibly they turned that the day two um the commanding general was made aware of this and goes all right bring your troops bring them to the to the center they'll be that's where they'll be the safest so they can get a day's rest yep. not realize <laughs> oops. yep move them right thanks, to the middle man. thanks and, general and again wide open fields a gradual incline Awful. but yeah, you know, if you're walking, Rocky. you're not even out of breath no. after after you. I I, I, I made the walk one time, and I was there to see what it was like. And it was, oh, did you really? Yeah, 
Yeah, right from right from the wood line all the way to where the the twentieth main um, statue is. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I I made that walk, and it was literally a mile and a half. Couldn't be more open. And when we say charge, it wasn't a it wasn't a charge. It was the old school. You know, if you see if you've seen the Patriot or other old school, you know, war Civil War movies, American Revolutionary War movies, literally just soldiers marching straight at a line of soldiers. Again, had the that had the higher ground. Canisters going off over their heads, you know, cannonballs flying by, just tearing limbs off, destroying, you know, half companies of men, and uh, it was a disaster. But it was it was almost a last ditch effort by. Um, but then, then yeah. KDL in the middle of the middle of the march, they would stop and and close ranks, close the yep. gaps where yeah. they lost men. I mean, it 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 was a magnificent thing to behold from what I, I was told, but utterly insane, like mm-hmm. a complete just- stupid, stupid, stupid maneuver. Um, and and Leah proved well, it, did it for and, hundreds of years. Yeah, I know, but uh, but Lee had done things so differently up until that yep. point, and when he had that, you know, because uh, even Longstreet said it's don't do this is a bad idea, but he had to send he had to send everyone, you know, yeah. his, it was it was his duty to do it. No but, last last ditch effort. Yep, but they I don't think they really needed that. They should not have gone up the middle uh, over all that unexposed ground. You know, reforming in the middle. You know, like you said, like a half a mile away. And there was okay. like a fence or something there too. It was, was like a fence too. Was a yeah. farmer's field that's uh, a farmer's fence that that stopped. Oh. That stopped, and they're like, "Do we go over it? Do we go around it? How do we get through it?" They're just standing there in the middle of a field, getting yep. shot at. They climbed and then over a, it. Yep. And then a cannonball comes through and wipes out half of a you know half of a company or whatever. And then they yes. stop again to reform that company. Might have they're just standing there. And they still almost they still almost took the ridge. Yeah. It's still all they say still broke the line, but the line reformed on, on the north and they right ended up repelling. And at that point, too, I, I believe part of it was because you could see it coming, and it, it, it's not something that happened in, in you know a couple minutes, it was you know a good, yeah. good dozens of minutes went by as you know this attack started. And more and more troops, I, I believe, they were funneling the union was funneling troops from the flanks in to help you know preserve yeah. the line because you can see all yeah. the troops, they're like, This is it, well, they don't have any more. That's like the whole J hook strategy is that you know, if Lee wanted to go from one side of the hook to the other. He'd have to travel what I think it was six miles, but for right. the Union, it was just like two and a half miles straight across right. because of the J shape. Exactly. And whenever they, you know, they could communicate a lot faster. And then when they heard that there was places that they needed to fill in, they were able to fill in significantly quicker than the than the South could right. uh, pursue. Oh, shit. Yeah. We got to pick this up. Ari just yawned. Uh oh. <laughs> yep. We got to go. We got, we got you know, we'll, we'll wrap it up at the end of 1860s, right? Okay. Our, our dear We're viewers, uh, General good. Minahan took about an overdose of melatonin. Yeah, <laughs> I thought I thought I thought melatonin was Advil. Yeah, I, so he, uh, he he took yeah. it uh, a little too much. <laughs> I, took, I took a lot of melatonin. <laughs> Mind you, he's wearing like a Bob Marley shirt or something too. Well, I'm wearing so a Bob Ross like, shirt. He just want to get want to get zooted for the show, I think. But you know, I don't blame yeah. yeah. Drunk history. It was an idea thrown around. Might have to do that one day. Well, yeah, be drunk history. Be honest with you. Kevin from Bristol showed his ass on the YouTube channel. I think would be fun. <laughs> That's true, actually. <laughs> like, <laughs> didn't get kicked off. Yeah, well, ho- holiday <laughs> special. Get the eggnog fun a little bit. It'll be fun. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> Gettysburg. But anyway, so Gettysburg was the really the the victory, the the decisive victory the Union needed. And obviously, there were mistakes by the by the South, but you can say that about any battle. Um, and it really just destroyed any hopes of Lee, you know, making it having any effect in the North for the rest of the war. Uh, it really forced Lee for the rest of the war to really be on the defensive, especially right. now, um, you know, short, literally the same day. So this goes from July 1st to July 3rd, bloodiest battle in the civil war. Um, the next day you have Vicksburg officially surrenders uh, grant. So the Anaconda plan is now complete and full effect. So now it's just a, it's a war of attrition and just basically bleeding the South dry. And, you know, in, in, in the East, you had Gettysburg with the mass amounts of resources, one, that can't be undersold. And obviously men that, that were tough for the South to replace. Now you also have, you know, the North knowing the South won't get any more, or it's going to be tough for them to get any more resources anymore. Obviously men are, are in short supply as well. So um, it, it really is the turning point of the war, in my opinion. I don't know if people disagree with that. Uh, we can talk about it, but it, it's the turning point. Just that, that, time period that early july 1863 with gettysburg and vicksburg happening you know within hours of each other um is where i think the war turns and from that on it's almost just a matter of time so not even um 
not even thinking about like the military aspects of it, but just public morale. You know, you, right. you the headlines on July you know, 4th and 5th are, you know, huge union victory, huge union victory. Mm-hmm. You know, Lincoln's, in, you know, Lincoln's freaking ecstatic. If you're a member of the general public, like, oh, it's just going pretty well. Like, you know, maybe I'll enlist. Like, right. since it's, you know, Especially which with the draft June. that just started a couple months ago, too. Yeah, yeah so you've got, you know, 1863, huge turning point. You get the Emancipation Proclamation and then just, just for public morale, I guess. It's just yep. it's it's un- unbelievable compared to like a year before, right? Complete one eighty, and and for the South as well because now where they were seeing victory after victory, oh, even the chances so now they saw an overwhelming Uh-oh. defeat in in Pennsylvania, so they realized that they're going to be on the retreat. Yep, um, but I, they still I'll, held on. Yeah, and I'll I'll equate it kind of like a um they're like a football team, big football guy here, not to brag. Um it's like it's like if you're if you're the underdog in a football game and it's going well, you're throwing out trick plays and everything's working, you know, you're chewing the clock and the other team's pumping the ball away and you're you are you are you are keeping it close, you're winning and all of a sudden, you know, their best play, you know, Tom Brady makes a play to, you know, throws a 80 yard bomb to, you know, Randy Moss back in the day, really throw it back. Um and then all of a sudden all that work you did is great, but now you're still losing. Right. It's right. the same. It's the same thing. It's a it's a punch in the gut that you know is tough to recover from because they just don't have the ability to based off of what they have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they also didn't. The, the general population is so um, they were still so damn loyal and stubborn. I mean, yeah, you had the strength. Like we said, the Anaconda Plan was now in full strangulation mode. They weren't getting any supplies. Everything that they were supplying the troops with was coming from the southern, the Confederate states. Yep. So maybe Texas was sending stuff, but you know, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, the Carolinas were, were just pumping, you know, raw materials and finished materials, you know, to the to the mm-hmm. front lines for the troops. But it's not an endless supply, and they have no. to eat at home too. You yep. know, so there's you know, there's so it's it, they didn't realize in their stubbornness that. The best thing right then in like say July fifteenth, eighteen sixty three, should have been to sue for peace. Yep. Or at least call for a peace chalks or something. But that would have been unheard of. They wouldn't have done it. They would have they wouldn't have they wouldn't have done it. And we're not talking about the industrial capital of the, of the country either. I mean, that's obviously all in the north. So it's right. tough, even if they have all resources, agriculture. Turn into, mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. All it would take would be like a drought. You know, if they if they had a like a, a really bad drought, that'd just be it. No food. Yeah, right. they would have been able to. They, they really just starved. I mean, they, they yeah. were. They didn't end up doing too well, anyways. But no, uh, they did history. Right, you but know, even, if there was a drought, would they have sued for peace? Maybe I don't know. Perhaps, but has there ever been a drought in the South? I don't think I don't so. Know. I have no I idea. So. But what I'm saying, they, they almost got it with the, the railroads. <laughs> There's were, a reason why they grow a lot in the South because it's pretty yeah. humid. But uh, one of the big one of the big strengths was the uh, the railroad. And until the Union severed the railroad ties. Especially like Atlanta, which connected every major city huge, from Atlanta. Huge Confederate uh, train hub. Yep, big hub. So uh, they so they still had like a, a, a Atlanta was really the heart of the South because the 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 the, the train lines were like the arteries, the blood carrying out supplies, yep. and and it only took really until uh, they had what do they call them? R. A. Sherman's bow ties, where the uh, they go and they mm. they cut the rail lines and they they heat them and bend them and make them into you know, a bow. So they could not be redone, reused, and, and repaired. And once they did that, they just it was just, you know, the clock was ticking on the end, right? They're on they're on their death throes. Yeah. But again, they still didn't realize that. Yep. No. So Gettysburg is a, a massive turning point. Um, you will see draft riots start to come around in, in places like New York, um, right around the same time throughout the summer. Um, but those really fall, especially after the after Gettysburg, those really fall in deaf ears, one for Lincoln and also for um, you know, the general general public of the North, as we talked about, was pretty, pretty jacked up after, you know, a, a, a big victory and a victory you can actually celebrate as opposed to reading about, you know, draws or defeats or near misses for the first couple of years of the war. Um, really after that, you have a lot of both sides kind of, you know, licking their wounds. Not a lot right. happened through the rest of the summer. I mean, it was, a again, the, the, the bloodiest battle in American history was when you count well, both sides. And we, and we talked about, the uh, I think, two episodes ago and, and last episode that Grant was moving from the Western campaign of, of like Middle Tennessee. He goes out to Vicksburg. When does he get when does he get called back to Washington? So he's in. Right. So I was going to get to him. So, again, not much happens with the rest of the summer. Um, in the fall and September, you have uh, Grant with another siege, this time in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So he's still oh, yeah, in the West right. in, in the fall of 1863. Um, he's back. Yep. And then you have, um, you know, the the actual Battle of Chattanooga itself, 
uh, when the siege gets broken. But that's not till late November, right around Thanksgiving time, um, 1863. So I believe Grant's not put in charge at least till 1864. Yeah. No, right. And he leaves right. Sherman down on the west, and that's where Sherman's march to the sea begins uh, in 1864 as well. But I also think that Lee detached Longstreet to Chattanooga to not as the overall commanding general, but again as like the number two. Um, yep. Uh, so he he actually it, w- it was a stalemate, but it's still a victory for the. Um, it could have been much worse. So Braxton Bragg was the head was in command of the, the Army of Tennessee. There you go. Which is yep. I'm assuming Fort Bragg's named after him. Probably, yeah, yeah. So, 1863 was a pretty rough year. Yeah, yeah, definitely the um, and rough in its in the amount of casualties. But again, the 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 fighting is down compared to the 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 first couple years of the war. The Overall, scale, the scale is larger, though, isn't it? Yeah, is exactly. The scale is a lot larger, and obviously, one side can afford to do that; the other side really can't. Cool. So I mean, I think I think we can leave it there, guys. I think that's a good, you know, good kind of yeah, turning point day show, day and then we can we we'll hit the rest of the war uh, a little later. You guys on. want a fun fact before we leave? Yeah, sure. Just want a fun fact. Love one of the uh, one, one of the generals at Gettysburg is uh, Abner Doubleday. Ah, there we go. Wow, the inventor of baseball. Oh, wow. Founder of baseball. baseball. Inventor of that. baseball, good, yeah. allegedly. Allegedly, there's some. Allegedly, it was, it was allegedly. based off of a British game called Rounders. Rounders. Abner Doubleday yeah. pretty. It almost certainly didn't invent baseball. We should do that one day. Just the the history the history of baseball really just. Um, Kirk you know, would love that. Really blend. Yeah, I could. I, could, I yeah, know. Really blend. Blend. So so Kirk's not watched this yet. He's never gonna watch friggin. So, Austin, do you ever take this the the class in college that I took the history? Yes, of baseball? I hated it. it was, so I took so a history of really, baseball class too. There was a class oh, in college. It was, it was a history of baseball. Class. You could take it as an African American studies class, women's gender studies class. <laughs> Any it would check it would check any of the boxes. It hey, what? Women's so, studies and yeah, it was yeah, a great elective class. Great yep, right elective class to check a box. But you you laugh though. It was Gym. essentially that. This guy was off the rails. I mean, and, he, like, so I took I one that was he, wild. He, he wouldn't post his PowerPoint slides because he said he didn't want anybody to take like his proprietary information. I'm like, you can find this information anywhere on the internet, my guy. Oh my god! And yeah. like and intellectual was, property. Like, yeah, it was his intellectual property, and it was just like the other thing was he was so freaking old, and it's just like he he was like uh, one of those guy old guys that wanted baseball to stay the same. He didn't want any changes. I'm like, well, mm-hmm. uh, but his mind was still exciting. It, it was the yeah, it was like it, picture what you think this professor for this class would look like. That's what he looked like. I, I mean, like, yeah. couldn't be you know like bald head on the top, gray hair. I'm know, thinking like Joe Castiglione like, to be honest with you. Yep. Yes. <laughs> Bingo. Could have been his younger brother. Could have been his younger brother. Definitely. Well, I was so, thinking, who's the, who's the uh, who was the writer for the um, for the Globe, the, the baseball writer who's in love with the players. I can't oh, think of his name. Oh, um, Pete Abram. Pete Abram. Yeah. I'm yeah. Pete Pete Abram. Abraham. Yeah. Abraham. Uh, but the, uh, um, the I never they had specialized classes to that level like baseball. I took a history of baseball. Oh yeah, you had to like apply to enter into the class. Yeah, like, you, you had to. Yeah, there was like a an application process. There was like a yeah. Like, why I do you want to be in this class? Because it was like an interesting yeah. class, so like there'd be yeah. a ton of people that wanted to get into it. So oh. you'd have like an application process. Oh, all right. Like half the kids in the class, like UConn has this the the satellite campus Avery Point. So like half the kids in my class played baseball at Avery Point, which is uh, a pretty high level JUCO team in the country. But it's just like. That's all you had to do. So, also, mean, how pretentious do you have to be to have a, an application process to get into your elective class, by the way? An elective. Yeah, you, exactly. I was going to say, unless you're getting a degree in history, I mean, that class would be fun to take if you had extra, you know, you needed right. some electives. Right. But I uh, know. No, the, the history classes I took were all like more specified stuff. Because I always liked in college, they offered history, advanced history class that you never would have gotten in high school, even in AP history. You know, so they had like, you know, the history of Japan. Which they couldn't do in high school. They just don't have time, yeah. right? We took that. Or, you know, we took that together all the time. Did, yeah, that. I yeah. loved that. I loved taking all those. Like, um, uh, we did history of the, of the Western tribes, which they couldn't do in. in, in t- they touched on oh, it in shit. high school, right? Oh, it's great stuff. The cool but they didn't one. talk about the Comanche, though. Uh, they, they missed <laughs> out. No, I, I wonder why, Ned. Right? I oh, wonder. Thank God. We gotta do a, back, we gotta do a Comanche show right after. Right after we do baseball, we do the Comanche one. Yeah. 
Uh, we could do baseball though. I, I'd be up for a baseball show. Every guy, right at the start of the season. You know, right? You know, when, when the, yeah, stuff. next year we're, we're really <laughs> playing. Start by reading that. We'll start by reading that yeah. poem. We'll read that. You know, the Hope String, Springs Eternal poem. We can start with that and then go, <laughs> go right from there. All right. So next week. Next week. So for you, dear our, listeners, hanging on this point, long. Yeah. Thank you for that. Sorry for our, our rant. It always goes there, though. You know that. Yeah. Um, turning point this week, next week, we'll wrap the war up and maybe draw some parallels to what we might see in less than a week in this country. Who knows? Um, and maybe a little twofer. We'll talk. Well, next, we'll twofer next week, it'll be. Also. Next week, the election will be over. It'll be over next week. Unless you guys want to go early. Yeah. Yeah. Will it be over, though? Like, are we, yeah, you, 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 guys, you guys think there's going to there's gonna be an actual results on Tuesday night? I thought, Maybe, I thought I they know. just passed that like North Carolina. You can have your ballots um, like nine days after or something like that. Oh, God. Maybe I just hallucinated and read that somewhere. Right. But yeah, you might be hallucinating right going. now. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's voter fraud. <laughs> yeah. Oh, voter fraud. <laughs> All right. So next week, All right, we're we going to wrap it up. See what else. <laughs> see where it goes. Nine. Watch, like, comment. Oh, sorry, subscribe. you're right. I'm you're right. against that here appropriately. Pass yeah. it on to friends. Uh, please be sure to. Uh, Watch, like, subscribe, leave a comment right down below. Uh, thanks as always, Ned Snark, awesome from the London, Ari Menahan. We are the History Buffs, and we will talk to you.